wonder how many would get the answer right if I was to ask the question. Uh, can sin affect your relationship with God? Pardon? No. You're sure? Yes. We're going on then. Uh, you all got that? Anyone not realize that that's true? Sin cannot affect your relationship with God. It might affect your fellowship, but not your relationship. If you're truly born of God, you're a son, and that relationship cannot be affected. Amen? We're going on with Abraham uh, and the story of Abraham. It's, um, it's uh, in chapter 20, you remember we got to, and um, it's beautiful, this part of the story of Abram, or Abraham as he now is, because you remember in the last uh, uh, story, his nature was changed when God spoke to him, gave him the covenant of circumcision, and his nature was changed, or God changed his name. And he now had the covenant promises, and you remember the seven I wills of the covenant and they're the same as same number um, when God says I'm the Lord God Almighty they're the same number as appears in Exodus when God speaks to the children of Israel uh, a second time and gives a covenant promise there and once again you get seven I wills but I want to go on now in um, chapter 20 verse 1 and Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Sheer, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abram said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, or Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And uh, really, I just briefly touched on it, but I want now to go on and really uh, share with you what it means. Uh, there's a lot hidden in Scripture and a lot of things happen. And if you just read it with um, simple eyes, you don't appreciate what you're reading. You need your eyes of your understanding to be opened and you need the Spirit of God to quicken within. And um, Abram had gone along and lived his life and there's no apparent reason now he's got the covenant promises of God and God said I'm going to make you a mighty nation there is no reason why Abraham should in any sense have had fear and yet he did and the interesting thing is that he says um, uh, she is my sister and Abimelech the king uh, took sent and took Sarah. Now, it's amazing with all these covenant promises, and don't forget, he's had the covenant of circumcision, and God has established the covenant with him. God has made the covenant sure, and he's seen the sacrifice taken, and you remember, chased away the fowls of the air. All that's been done, and now. He slides right back to a trick he played all that time ago when he went to Pharaoh in Egypt. Do you remember? And he came out with the same story. Now, why do you think it is that it was lurking there? Well, I'll tell you. Because God caused Pharaoh to throw Abram out when he was in Egypt. You remember? And uh, he took Sarah and he went and departed because you remember God had shut up the wombs of all the women in Egypt just for, for Abram's sake and um, now you find God puts Abraham in a situation where the old attitude comes up and it's interesting to note that even though Abraham at this point has had a nature change he's still goes back to what he agreed before God ever dealt with him. For if you look in uh, verse 13, you'll find uh, when he's explaining it, 
uh, to Abimelech and um, verse 12, or, or let's take verse 11 and say, um, Abram said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, He is my brother. Now the amazing thing is that this covenant agreement between Sarah and Abraham was forged when he was still in Ur of the Chaldees before he left his father's house. Now you remember when he left his father's house he made mistakes by taking Lot with him and taking his relations with him. But now right down the road we discover that the thing that keeps bugging Abraham and taking him down the drain is a covenant that he made before he ever came to a real knowledge of God in a covenant relationship. He made a covenant with Sarah and God wasn't going to allow that covenant and that deception to remain in his life. So what did he do? He'd put him in Egypt once, he got thrown out of Egypt, he'd never cleared up the thing, it was still lurking there, it was an old trick that he was going to produce again. And so, out he comes again, same old thing. Now the Lord's wonderful. He knows just where to hit us. He knows just what pressure to apply in our lives to bring out our needs. There are things that lurk in our lives that were forged years and years and years ago. Fears that dominate our hearts. But they don't manifest themselves until we're under a certain amount of pressure. It's easy to come to a fellowship or a church and while you're in the meeting not to sin. That's not difficult. Uh, it's easy to set your heart on God while everyone's praising and worshipping. And it's easy to live your life during the day without sin whilst there's no pressure. But if we just lived like that in kind of cotton wool, enclosed and protected, our lives won't get dealt with. So God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy and love, arranges for each one of us wonderful things called circumstances which are going to try us. Now these circumstances are the ideal ones for you they will produce the very nasty things about you. They will bring it to the surface. As a refiner's fire purifieth the silver, so in the crucibles of God we find all the impurities rise to the top. It's when the heat's on and the pressure's on, all those nice things about us seem to vanish, and we discover all those qualities that we would like to keep hidden don't we? When the pressure's really there, that's the time we find that we can't hide them. Now when there's no pressure, why we're such wonderful people. But the pressure comes. Now God knows what pressure to put on you. In fact, he organizes all your circumstances to get you to have the right pressures. Isn't that wonderful? He's so considerate. He knows just what you need. And so, with Abraham, he caused him to sojourn in Gerar. And there was Abimelech. And you remember at this time, Sarah's 90 years old. Well, I don't know if... If I was a king and I saw someone at 90, I'm not sure I'd want to take her into my house. Um, but there you are, she must have worn well. That's all I can say, because she was still attractive enough for Abimelech to send for her to his house. And 
takes her in. And she must have been physically on a bit because it says that um, it had ceased with her as a custom of women was. So in other words, she was knocking on the door. But her looks don't seem to have been that tarnished. Let's hope that when we get to that age, we won't be quite as tarnished as some. But there she was, and Abimelech sends for her. But the reason for this fear was really a covenant was, that was made. And if you look in your life, you will find that irrational things happen. And when you examine it, very often it's the thinking that you had before you ever came to Christ. There's things when the pressures come that provoke you and your attitudes and your responses basically come from way before you were ever converted. Uh -huh. And God knows just what one's to put on you. And you see, it's called the dealings or the refinings of God. It's not an acceptable doctrine, it's sanctification if you'd like. Uh, God's beginning to set you apart from your humanistic ways, your old ways. So he puts you to live with wonderful people who will never agitate you. Um, he gives you a job with um, customers who are so polite and courteous, you, you, you wonder how you could ever meet such nice people. He sticks you in a church where everyone's perfect. Um, he uh, causes all your family to understand everything you're doing. Uh, everything gets arranged to put pressure on you and things begin to surface, don't they? You know, those delightful little ways of yours. And someone says something and immediately up bubbles a response. Now the response is totally wrong. The reason it surfaces is because basic fears underlying everything. Fear and insecurity. And that's really what's in the heart of most people. Everyone wants to be loved and so we lie within ourselves really. We don't face truth. People don't like truth, not really. They hide from it. And one of the things in a church is truth must out. And if a pastor is faithful to his people and is really caring for them and loving them, unfortunately he will not be the positive person always telling you how wonderful you are. Um, though, I dare say, with all of you, there is a lot to wonder at. He will more likely express your needs and put his finger on things you don't like. He got an aggravating uh, idea of seeing that what's necessary is to bring correction and readjustment and realignment. You see, your whole thinking and your whole mind and your whole being needs to be adjusted till you come in tune with God, till you have the mind of Christ, till the things that are deep down inside that your family put there, that your father and your mother taught you, that your relations have taught you, that your school taught you, that experiences taught you, your university taught you, this happened, that happened, all those things are inside and make up the you that you are. Peculiar as you are. Strained as you are. And then God and his infinite love and wisdom brings these wonderful pressures on you for an opportunity to show you just how ugly you are. And you see the ugliness of it arise and you don't like it. Something happens, the pressure comes and boom! What is this? Hmm? True? Oh 
no, that's not me. I'm not like that. I'm nice. I'm sweet as honey. Uh, until. I always find that, uh, you know, I'm married, I'm glad to say. Uh, I would never manage if I wasn't married. I mean, what would I do with my washing and stuff? Um, we all need marriage. There you are. And um, one of the things I've discovered is uh, it's so easy to get along when my wife agrees with me, which she always should. Now, I mean, there's only one problem. Sometimes she doesn't. Now, then one has to make a decision. Of course, the decision's always that I'm right and she's wrong. However, that might not always be the right decision. But most of us, when we relate to people, uh, it's when the pressure of the relationship becomes that we begin to draw back, don't we? Hmm? Now, God puts us in those pressures to deal with things in us. God's getting at you, man or woman. Don't think that the circumstances are accidents. God's got his plan. He wants to show you what's really in there. But he wants to show it to you, not so that you feel condemned, but so that you say, oh, wonderful, Lord, I, I see that. Dear, oh, dear, that's terrible. And you'll repent and get rid of it. And you'll begin to fight it and say, well, look, I can't afford to have this in my life. It mars it and spoils it. Now, it won't immediately vanish. Things that are deep-seated in our hearts don't, do they? Sometimes you'll have a battle and a fight to get rid of it. Won't you? Now, that's no problem. And if it doesn't go the first time, like in Egypt, then God will put you in a gerar when he's got his covenant more firmly established. And the same circumstance is going to force the same thing up. Once Abram saw that same fear, uh-uh, you know, my wife, she's still attractive, he might, uh, they, they might kill me and I want to preserve my life. Uh, then immediately the old lie came back. It was something that was related to a long time ago, 30 odd years before, and yet it was still lurking there. And God's infinitely patient. Now you'll notice that he didn't try this lie out when he attacked the, um, the kings that had came um, to attack Sodom and Gomorrah, and he went and fought against them and slew them and brought Lot back and all his goods, and he didn't lie. Um, quite a long time he kept Sarah as his wife but when the same pressure came back the same thing came up now it needs to teach us something and it's this do you know it's possible uh, to go without falling in a certain area for a long long time but I assure you that if you haven't really had that area dealt with Sooner or later, God in his wonderful love and grace is going to give you exactly the circumstances to stir up the little nest. And you will find that you've got chicks brooding in there. And up will come the same problem. Have you ever found that? Hmm? Have you found it happening already? And oh dear... I thought, Lord, I, I thought that was dealt with. Well, no, it wasn't. And Abraham finds this little problem come up. Now God's about to deal with him. But God is very gracious, and we talked about grace. And I want you to look at the grace of God in this story. Because it's very important to understand, firstly, that Abimelech was a heathen. That's one thing. And then... Um, God, um, let's look at, for, before we go further, let's just have a look um, in Proverbs. Keep your finger here. In Proverbs 27, verse 19. Uh, 
And in Proverbs 27, verse 19, as in the water, I'll just read it out, don't bother looking for it. As in the water, face answereth to face, so is the heart of man to man. Now what it means is simply this. If you look in the water, and you look in the water that shows a reflection, what will you see? your face, won't you? And when the Spirit of God puts pressure on you and the Spirit's referred to as water and as a river, what are you likely to see? Yourself. And when you really begin to see yourself, it's then you realize how horrible you are. Until God, by His Spirit, begins to work on you, you're nice, aren't you? And one of the things is um, also... Um, we find that uh, our worst faults are always reflected in other people. See someone with something that really annoys you and then you know what your problem is. That's the thing. You hate it because, boy, has it got you. I mean, it's... It, it, that's one of the niggly things. So is the heart of man to man. And you find that your reflection, you don't like seeing in others, do you? And it says, What knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man that's in him? And by human spirit, you can know what's in other people. It's not discernment. You can know that without the spirit of God. You can know... Um, just by a human spirit what's in other people uh, discerning is discerning of spirits it's not um, telling what's in a person and you need to understand that um, I know what's in someone else because I have a human spirit I know what motivates people to do things because I've got the same things that motivate me to do things I know the little tricks you get up to because I tried them long ago. The quality of a pastor or qualification is that he's done more things wrong and made more mistakes than anyone else more quickly so God says his experience make him a pastor. Uh, he doesn't choose out the people who have never done anything. He chooses out, as I said, the have-nots and the are-nots and the weren't-nots and shouldn't-bes. And he says, they'll do. And we have to realize that. Uh, you might not like it. You have to lump it. And God came to Abimelech and said to him, Behold. And if God came and said this to you, I think it would upset you. Behold, thou art a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now I want you to notice that God is a God of wonderful love, mercy and grace. And imagine his opening words to Abimelech. There's a poor guy and he's going to sleep and God speaks to him by a dream in the night and says you're dead. That's the end of you, man. Now, God has a way. Now, most people, when they preach the gospel, say, oh, you know, just tell about the love of God. Don't tell the negatives. I mean, I had a man from America recently. He came over to me and he said, you know, one of your problems is you're so negative. I said, well, I thought that's part of the gospel. Oh, no, no, no. Just tell people how wonderful they are. Leave out the other side. I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't tick that way. I mean, everything to be balanced, you have a positive and negative. Try electricity with just a positive. It won't work. Try um, anything with just positives and no negatives, and it's unbalanced, isn't it? You've got to have both. If you always said yes to everyone, um you'd be in problems. You've got to have a positive and negative. In life, you've got to have a positive and negative. 
And you see, in the spiritual things, there's got to be a positive and negative. And God starts with the negative. Uh, God always starts with the negative. For instance, God brings conviction of sin, doesn't he? He shows you what a rotten, filthy, degraded, decrepit, horrible wretch you are. Doesn't he? And then you think, oh! And you look for a saviour. Now, who looks for a saviour before he's seen the negative? Or he puts a pressure in your life which causes you to have desperation and you know you need help. Don't you? God always starts with the negative. And if you find a real negative in your life, thank God for it because a positive will come. Because you see, God's not all negative. But when the negative comes, you know he's going to do something positive. Isn't that good? And therefore, you need the balance of both. And you've got to appreciate that. I like the negative. I like the things that challenge the heart, don't you? I like the things that tell me the way it is. I don't want the sham. I don't want people to tell me I'm nice. I'm not. Who, uh, you know, I don't want to be humanly acceptable. That's not right. If you don't like it, lump it. You know, you, there's no way that we should be a people that become sugary sweet. I always remember when I was a youngster, um, I used to be able to do something that um, now would damage my figure <coughs> more than it is. And that was, I used to find sugar bowls on the top of tables and empty them not on the floor, I used to eat them. And I would always go, and because we had a hotel at the time, and I could sometimes go into the dining room and find 30 tables with sugar bowls, it was quite an occupation. Uh, when there was silence, my mother knew that it was time to go to the dining room and find out which table I was under. <laughs> uh, and there I'd be, usually with the fullest bowl. And uh, it's funny, but my son seems to have acquired the same habit. Uh, I, I didn't tell him about that. He's just got it. Um, now, the thing is, okay. But then, you know, the, there was the other side when I had to take medicine. And medicine's an awful thing. I think that doctors spend years and years working out how to make things taste horrible and then decide that it'll do people good. Uh, and I, I, I think that that's why they spend years at university to become a pharmacist, because they have to know how to make it taste horrible. Otherwise, people won't believe it does them any good. And at least that's my theory. And my mother would always try and coat it with sugar and try and convince me that it wouldn't taste bad. But the sugar used to go and you'd get this horrible taste. I'm sure you all know what I mean. But the thing was that sometimes one thing is more dominant than another. The nasty taste was not more dominant than the sugar. So I need a good dollop of sugar afterwards or something sweet to get rid of the horrible taste. Now, when God shows us something negative, he's got a good dollop of love to put right on top. But, uh, and grace will move. But the thing is that we need the bitterness too. There is gall and bitterness, and there is anguish of heart, and there is shock, isn't there? When medicine comes, and our medicine that does us good is to really show us what we are, and when those things rise up, then God in his grace and his love will deal with them. But we've got to see, and something we've got to learn, is what the spring of it was. Now you see, Abram realized where the spring was in verse 13, didn't he? He said, and it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house. In other words, what Abram did was he identified the source of his problem. 
he went back and he said, now the reason I reacted this way was because of all those years ago I made that covenant. And at that point, light came and he dealt with the thing that was wrong. And we always need to find the source that causes us to react in the way we do. The way God roots things out of our life is he takes us back to its source. And you begin to realize that a pattern has developed in your life and you need to go back to the source and root it up. Now, these things have to be dealt with. Now, I'm not suggesting, and please understand this, I'm not suggesting that you now go home and you sit down and you work back through your life and you think about everything and, you know, you, you live back. I mean, there's a, a theory and... Um, <laughs> thank God it's a theory, that uh, there's some madmen in England. Well, there's many. But these certain madmen are Christians and doctors. And they got this theory that you could re go back and you could relive your experience inside your mother's womb. Would you believe it? And so they'll get people to lay on the floor, they lay a cushion on them, and they will go into a trance-like state and they'll start making all the noises they'd make as a baby in the womb. And then they'll, uh, they say they can readjust. Now these are people who are meant to be Christians. They're psychologists and it, it's a trick in psychology and it's done by an evil spirit. And so you'll get all these reactions. I remember someone telling me about it and how God was delivering them and healing their memories and all that junk. And, and I, I thought about it and I said to the person, tell me, what happens if you were a caesarean birth? Do they get a scalpel, slit the cushion and pull you out the middle? Um, <coughs> you know, I mean, the whole thing's so farcical. You, you know, God only deals with one thing at a time. Now I would, uh, he dealt with everything in one go, but when it comes to dealing with our personalities and the things that have um, got us wrong ideas, then he's very particular. He squeezes you into a corner and he gets one thing, the dominant thing that he wants to deal with, and he pushes that all the time. And the other things don't seem to matter. They pale into insignificance. While God has got you on the mat and there's one thing he wants to get out of you, there's no way that you're going to dodge it. And that's his grace and his love. Now you might stand up and you'll find he'll bat you down and he'll keep you there, pinned to the place, until you let it be dealt with. Have you found that? The one thing becomes the dominant thing in your life. That's what you need deliverance from. Now, when you get delivered, something else comes up. But at this point, that one thing. And at this point with Abram, it was that. But the grace of God is wonderful. Because God did something here. And if you, if you go on, you'll read in verse 4, but Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. I, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. And you remember we discussed this last time. Now, if you want to see a similar passage in Proverbs 21. Um, Proverbs 21. And uh, verse 1. The king's heart, it is in his free will. As the rivers of waters, he can turn it to do whatever he wants. 
Proverbs 21, verse 1. Isn't that what it says? No. What does it say? The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. So who controls the king's heart? God. You see, God controls our desires. God controls everything about us. Now, God will remove his restraining hand at times and allow us to go into sin. He won't cause us to sin. And with every temptation, he'll make a way of escape, but he'll allow us to be tried. He allowed Job to be tried, didn't he? Now, you remember when Peter came along and Peter said, Lord, though everyone else desert you, I never will. And Jesus said, look, before the cock crowed twice, thou wilt deny me thrice. Now, Jesus never ever said to Peter, look here, I'm going to be with you and I'll give you the power not to sin. No, he actually said, look, Peter, you think you can do it in your strength. I'll just show you what your strength is. Just wait. And then he calls up his rooster and he says, sit on that wall and just wait. And old Peter, the cock was waiting there. And then, you know, Peter was a, a man, a strange man. Because when he was in the garden and Jesus was there and they were free before Jesus was taken captive, you remember he took his sword and chopped off one of the guard's ears. And Jesus picked it up, stuck it back on. And um, But the point was, when he got, and this little woman, insignificant little maid, comes to him and said, you're one of the Galileans? And he said, I'm not. In the end, he denied it with an oath, and of course, the cock crew. But at one point, he was brave, and at the next point, he was a coward. Now, God knew exactly the place to get Peter in to prove to him what he was really like. And God knows with us exactly the place to put us in. Now, it's not to cause us to sin. God doesn't ever cause us to sin. But what God does, he permits it. Now, you might not like that, but that's true. God permits you to sin. Do you know this? God knew exactly the decision Adam and Eve were going to make when the serpent came and tempted him. Isn't that true? Because God foreknows everything. Now, he could have come down and stopped the serpent from tempting them. Couldn't he? But he didn't. Now, he permitted that temptation to come. And he permitted the fall to come. He permitted sin to enter into the world. But he'd already made a remedy for it. And Christ has made a remedy for all our sin. He's borne it on Calvary's cross. But sometimes he'll allow us to be tempted. Now with every temptation there's a way of escape. Some of us sometimes get tempted so much we just escape by the skin of our teeth. Other times we don't escape, we do a nosedive. But the way of escape then is via the cross and Calvary. He didn't say with every temptation you're going to win. But he did say with every temptation there is a way of escape. Now you might have assumed that meant that you could get out of every temptation. Well, let me tell you from 15 years of experience it's not true. There are temptations where you get put in a position and you find that God is really showing you what's in you. He shows you your capacity to rebel. He shows you your capacity to do things wrong. Now, there's only one way of escape then, and that's via the cross and the blood. So, well, I didn't think that was a way of escape. Well, what is it if it's not a way of escape? So, well, shouldn't I be able never to sin? Yes, you should, but... Uh, 
I doubt that you've got there yet, and when you do, God will take you home. You'll have been perfected and ready to meet him. So you're going to have problems, but when the problem comes, there's a fight and a battle to win a victory, and in that realm you'll win. Now, once you've won in that realm, and these are all realms in your soul, they're nothing to do with your spirit, because your spirit's become one spirit with God's spirit. But in your soul realm where it needs dealing with, you've got enemies in your soul and spiritual forces in your soul and things you've been taught from the past in your soul. And those things God wants to deal with. He wants to pull down the strongholds of Satan that are in your mind. And he wants to deliver you. Now he is putting wonderful opportunities in your life. Firstly to show you what you are and then secondly to deal with the thing. But most Christians don't like that. What they want is to believe that once saved, always saved. And uh, they don't want the fight to get their lives really changed inside. True? How many people like to avoid the real issues of life? You talk to them, they don't want to discuss it. They don't want to face up to what they really are inside. Most people don't like it. Once you get down to the real hub of things, the way they're living and what they're doing and what their motives are, then they get very coy and defensive. But God pushes us and he wants to get at our motives. Now there are times when by the grace of God he does what he did with Abimelech. He withheld him from sinning. And he didn't suffer him to touch Sarah. Now that was God's grace. And there are times when you'll cry out to God and in his mercy he'll deliver you and you'll scrape away. There are times when you'll plummet. Now do understand this. Um, if you die, if you go up in a, into a swimming pool and you go off the 10 meter board and you dive off into the air, and when you're halfway down, you say, oh God, please keep me dry. I assure you that God has one of two options. One is to empty the swimming pool, which is going to damage you. The other one is to let you hit the water and get wet. Now, with sin, it's rather like that. Some people uh, tempt the Lord. They put themselves in a situation, and so they dived off a diving board, and when they've gone to the brink, they pray at brinkmanship. They caught sin. And sin catches them. But they caught it. They see how far they can go without stepping over the edge. Well, do you know what I mean? How angry can I get before I've gone over the edge? And it's him. <laughs> Um, how, you know, how mad can I get, well, how involved can I get with this person before I, too far. Now, we as human beings love brinkmanship. It's something that we all play at. We like to, to do things which are questionable Providing we feel we can pull back at the last minute. Well, of course, I didn't sin. But boy, didn't you get close. And, you know, there are the questionable areas where uh, you can go to brinkmanship. Now, that is dangerous. And I want to assure you that one day God will be standing watching you and he'll see you going to the brink and he'll put his foot out and give you a shove. And you'll discover that your brinkmanship <laughs> has put you in a real problem. And he'll give you a little gentle shove right in. When I was at the holiday camp, you know, I was walking around and I saw this um, figure, or at least the semblance of one, clad in a swimming costume standing just at the end of the pool, edge of the pool, and being kind of someone with a normal human nature, it only took just a stretch of an arm, you know, as I, <laughs> I stretched, and she was in. Uh, and, you know, I helped her. But 
God's rather like that. He waits till we get to the brink and we'll test it, you know. We'll try it. We'll put our toe in. And then he'll let us go so far and then he says, all right, if you really want to find out, <coughs> and then you go. And then you say, oh, it's there. It's happened, you know. God, you know, it's terrible. Am I born again? I don't know where I am. You know, God can't love me. It's a terrible life. And how could I ever have done it? Well, the easy thing was don't stand on the edge of the pool if you don't want to go in. Don't get in a situation where you put yourself in that place. That's why you should pray. You know, it says in, in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I don't want to get led into it, but sometimes he permits me to step into it myself. He allows me to get into the situation and before I know it, zoink, I'm down. Hmm? Have you found that? At other times, he'll put me in this pressure situation and by his mercy and grace, I'll survive. Some of us feel like the walking wounded coming back from war every day. You wonder whether you'll survive and live through it for another day. Others of us, we scrape away with the skin of our teeth. Others never seem to get hit at all. Now, don't get smug if you feel that you have no problems. Don't get smug if you're one day when you won't want anyone to see. And he'll expose you for what you are. Don't you worry about it. I've found sometimes when I've gone to places and, and uh, I, I've not been there two minutes, and people fly into a rage. They talk about love and you know how you... All love and all grace. And I hit them on a soap. Ah! You know, and you see all the love and grace has vanished. And what's really inside, that horrible old man comes rearing to the top. Religion goes. And God's got these pressures. Now, grace and mercy means that God in his grace and mercy doesn't apply the pressure all the time. We live free for long periods of time and then the test comes. Hmm? And it's when the test comes you find out it's there. Now, don't despair. That's normal. Say, well, I failed. Well, you didn't want to be success, did you? See, if God's grace doesn't meet you and change you and help you, then you are going to fall, aren't you? And what God does is he allows you to try and sort yourself out in your own strength, first of all, and you'll find the first few times where you plummet to the earth and you dust yourself off and pick yourself up and you can't understand how it could happen to such a wonderful person as you. Um, God allows you to go on like that and he keeps pressuring you until you come to the place of saying, hey, buster, I can't do anything about this. This is me. It's what I really am. Ooh. Am I? Yeah, I am. Help! And then you begin to turn around, and your whole life begins to turn around, and you say, God, I need help. I can't do anything about it. Now, at that point, God will intervene. But he leads you to that point. As I've said before, blessed are the desperate, for they shall be delivered. And God won't deliver you till you really get desperate. Something that just doesn't bother you, God will leave there. He'll keep putting pressure on till it really is a pain. I was talking with um, David and Lisa Lowden came today and we were to visit us and we were chatting with them, a couple from Israel, I don't know if you remember them and they'll be with us at the end of the month and um, uh, at the weekend and when, when I was talking with David and, and Lisa something came up um, oh no it was when I I'd rung Ed on the phone I think. no it wasn't it was when I was talking with David and Lisa at lunchtime I was talking about one fellow we know who's a pastor and I suddenly said well you know if I had a wife like his, I think I'd have problems too. 
I mean, she is a pill of the first order. You know, and a bitter one at that. I mean, you know, I could forgive that guy anything. Um, well, almost. God wouldn't forgive him, but I could under... Well, let's put it this way. I could understand it, you know. I could <laughs> and when I say anything, I mean anything. Poor guy. Uh, and how he survives... Well, you know, I think I would have been had up for homicide, suicide, and genocide. I don't know. I'd have done a lot. I'd have wiped him out. I couldn't have stood it. But there you are. Um, he, he, he's been given abundant grace. I'd have sought a way of escape. <laughs> a double barrel shotgun <laughs> or something. I couldn't have stuck it. But he has. And she is a pillar of the first order. And yet, I think, well, God, in his grace and his love, uh, well, I don't know. I, I don't believe that. Um, no, I, I couldn't say that. What I will say, um, I'll rephrase it. Um, she's a pillar of the first order. And God has left her as a pillar of the first order. She is awful. Now, everyone gets what they deserve. Uh, and this poor guy, obviously, has got what he deserves. And God is trying to deal with him. And I wonder how God's going to deal with him. And what God wants to deal with. And why it's like that. But you see, when we, it, that's in one realm. But when we move into grace and we come into Christ, we move into a totally different area. And do understand this. I don't think God wants us to suffer in the sense of being destroyed. And this guy's being destroyed. That's not grace to me. That's the enemy. That something's gone wrong years ago. And maybe they should never have got married. I guess that's really the hub of the problem. But they did. And yet... When you're in Christ, God always gives a way of escape, doesn't he? And there is ways of escape. If I'll face up to a problem and really see it for what it is, God will show me a way out. And if I was him, I'd have taken the front door. Uh, and I'd have gone, I'd have said, that's it. I'm off. And... Yet I heard of another man who, who's got a real sweet wife. And, and yet, he's really messed up his marriage. Now, do you know, that I couldn't understand. I thought, now, why did he do that with such a lovely wife? That, to me, is a mystery. And yet, God obviously knew that problem was there. Now, we can't stand in judgment and say, well, that chap's terrible and this chap's wonderful or this chap, that chap. Who knows? Because the last chapter's not written. You don't know what God will produce in that life through all those circumstances. At the end of the day, that man might come out a trophy of grace. He might come out a trophy of something else, but he might come out a trophy of grace. I don't know till the last day when that man's going into glory and he's leaving this earth, I don't know what God's going to work out in his life. One thing I do know, though, God is careful to manipulate circumstances and give us all a chance. Now, we're sons of light, aren't we? And nothing that we do will change our relationship, will it? Once you're a son, you're a son, aren't you? Okay? That can't change. Can it? You sure? You're all sure about that? So, what the, the pressures that are put on us are to do what? To do what? To refine us. So everything that happens for our good. True? All things work together for good to them that love God, don't they? Hmm? To those who are the called according to his purposes. Now, it's not God's will that we should go into sin. Let me make that clear. But God sometimes allows us to fall 
so that we will learn what we really like. That's what I'm saying. Now please understand that I'm not saying that God causes us to sin. I want to make that clear. I'm saying he withdraws his restraining hand and we plummet. In other words, he lets us see what we really are. Now the reason he does it is because we try and do it in our own strength. Now when Abram came to Abimelech, he feared because he saw Abimelech. Instead of trusting in God to keep him and trusting in God to preserve his life, he thought he'd tell a lie to preserve it. And one lie leads to disaster, doesn't it? If you're a liar and you tell one lie, you have to have a very good memory because down the road you're going to have to tell more. That's why it's always best to tell the truth. If you goof, say, well, I, you know, I goof. That's the best thing to do. It's the easiest way. It's less taxing on your mind. Um, and we need to learn the lessons that this person learned, Abram. God really dug into him and took him right back to his early life and said, that's where it began. And you remember the story that Abram uh, says, Abimelech says in verse 9, he called Abram and said, What hast thou done unto us, and what have I offended thee, that thou hast bored on me and my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done unto me that, um, that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abram said, um, You know, uh, he made the excuses. And Abimelech took, um, in verse 14, sheep and ox, and men servants and women servants, gave them unto Abram and restored him, Sarah, his wife. All right, he says, off you go, Abram, I've had enough. But if you look back in verse 7, God had said to Abimelech, now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Now look at this. God's opinion of Abraham at this time was what? He was a prophet. Now here's a man who's in deceit, who's nearly caused a heathen king to sin, who's out virtually to destroy what God had planned. Sarah, you remember, was going to bear the chosen race, the Hebrew race, wasn't she? She was going to be the mother of the Hebrew race. Abraham had let her go with Abimelech. Now, Abimelech hadn't lain with her, we're told that, but he had permitted it to happen, even though he knew all the covenant promises. And God's opinion of Abraham, even though he'd done all that, was he's a prophet, Abimelech. Get him to pray for you and you'll be all right. Now, who thinks that a person must live po perfectly sinless before he can pray for someone else and they'll get healed or delivered? Abram prayed for Abimelech, and Abimelech lived. Now, isn't it amazing, from God's point of view, Abram's relationship hadn't changed. Even though he went right against what God wanted, Abram was still considered the promised father of us all. And what we have to realize in grace and in this life is God considers us to be what we are, sons of God, no matter what we do. God doesn't look at us as rotten, rejected people. Even when he puts us in pressures where we feel that, God's opinion of us is, you're my son. God's opinion of Abraham, this is a great prophet of Brimelech, you better get him to pray for you. I'm sure Abraham was feeling something different himself. I don't think he was feeling he was a great prophet. I think he was probably, when, it, when Abimelech called him and said, look, what's this you've done bringing this sin on us? I don't think Abram was thinking, what a great guy I am, what a wonderful prophet, God must think I'm wonderful. I think he was probably calling away, thinking, oh dear, oh dear. But God had said, now he's a prophet, and you get him to pray. God's consideration of what we are is very different from ours. God's opinion of us is very different from ours. God loves us. God sees what is going to make us.
And God looks on us in that way. Now, he doesn't wear rose-tinted glasses. He knows exactly what's in us, but he also knows exactly what our potential and end is. And therefore, he views us from that point of view, not from what we are currently. Therefore, there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Because I know that in the end, I'm going to be just like Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't worry me what I am today, because I know God's working on me and changing me, and I will be like him. And when I see him, I'm going to be like him, aren't I? And so are you. Now, I live in a confidence that God sees the end result. Okay, I've got a long way to go. In fact, it's miles and miles to go. But, God's opinion is that I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm seated in heavenly places. I've got to get there. And there's walking in this life has got to be lived. But I don't have any condemnation. When I come to God, I know he doesn't see me as I am. He sees me as I will be. That's a wonderful thing. God knows all my potential. And he says, look, this guy is going to be wonderful. <laughs> you know, I see him as he really is, you know, from all eternity. These humans round him, criticize him and see all the faults in him, well, they're dumb. Because what they don't realize is what I'm working out in his life. You know, they see him react to pressures. Well, that's all right, but they don't know what it's doing inside him and what it's making him. If they knew that, they'd respect him more. They'd realize that I chose him. And each one of you, God's got the same opinion. That's what he's saying about you. When people look at you and say, ah, you know, you call yourself a Christian and do that, they don't know what God's worked in you at that point when you fit, fell. You go away and you think, oh, how terrible. I don't I say, oh, sorry, Lord, that goof there. You know, and that's it. I forget it. Now, they might go away and remember it for years afterwards. I haven't. I've forgotten it. And very often you'll find the most unforgiving people are your fellow Christians. They can always remind you of your mistakes, can't they? People can always remember your mistakes, but they don't very often remember what good things you do. I find people always remember you for your faux pas. I've got a few of them too. But the wonderful thing is God looks at you and he says, I'm going to make a choice one of him. That's what he really is. And he's just getting there and Jesus looks and he says Father he says I'm interceding for that one I know exactly what you're going to make him don't let him get discouraged and bowed down because of what's going on at the moment it's only the pressures of the crucible of God that are just refining him just teach him how to live through it give him the grace Father and Father says yes son and so they go on together and we become his delight. That's when we move from grace to grace. And God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And that's us. His love is so wonderful. You can relax in him. It's easy to be a Christian. Pressures are there, but it's easy. Let's pray. Father, give us the grace and the ability to understand the pressures of life. Lord, let us see what you're working in us. Don't let us get bowed down and discouraged, Lord, but give us the faith to see that you're working out your perfecting work in our lives and our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that there is no condemnation to them or in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, you're dealing with us inside. You're changing us. Thank you that every trial and every temptation has a purpose. 
a purpose of refining us and molding us and making us. Lord, give us faith to see what it is you're really after. Give us an understanding heart. Thank you that you see us as we shall be. You know our potential. And Lord, thank you that we're coming to realize that potential more and more as you put the pressures on and deal with us and cleanse us and refine us. Lord, encourage each heart. Give each one of us true faith. Give each one of us, O oh God, an understanding heart to understand each other. And Lord, give us forgiving hearts and loving hearts. Give us tolerant hearts. Thank you for the precious God. Lord, let them work righteousness in us, we pray. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Take away, Lord God, any thought of anything else but thee now. Thou art welcome in this place, Lord God. Thou art welcome in my heart. Oh, Father, as we sing, may the words be true. May they not just be coming out of our mouths, Lord God, but coming out of our whole desire. Lord, the Creator God, the one who has done so much, thou art welcome in this place. Thou art welcome in my heart. Father, we don't understand why you bother with us, Lord. We can't comprehend your love. Father, thou art welcome. Melt our hearts, we pray, Lord Jesus. Come now. Lord, thou art welcome. Let's sing this meaning. Thou art welcome in my heart.
Lord Jesus, thou art welcome in my heart. Father, so often I make it my heart and shut you out. Lord Jesus, come now in the stillness. Come to my heart. Lord Jesus, Forgive me, Lord, for those times when I just pushed you away. Thanking you for the times when you've met me before. Just going on my own. Oh, Father, thou art welcome this night in my heart. Thou art welcome always, Father, in my heart. Oh, Lord, don't let me enjoy the welcome of someone else's heart. But Lord, thou art welcome in my heart tonight. Lord, I want to know that relationship with thee. Father, I want to just trust thee. As a son would look up in his father's face. Oh, Father, thou art welcome in my heart. So often, Lord, I complicate make it so difficult for you to come. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming again. Thank you, Father, that your love just compounds, grows and grows and never gives up. Oh, Father, sometimes we feel, how can we do such a thing to spurn your love? Come now, Lord, thou art welcome here. Lord, I want to know thee. Father, I want to know thee. For myself. Heavenly Father. 